Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome. We are now in our 26th update as it relates to coronavirus. And uh, really a lot of information today to cover, a lot of science, a lot of uh, interesting developments today. Um, and we're going to jump right in. I want to uh, talk first about fasting and uh, really grateful that so many people decided to join me on a 24-hour fast. Um, this is the time when you start to get kind of hungry. And uh, I would just say that as we break our fast this evening, uh, it would be um, really a, a, a neat thing to think about um, gratitude. You know, you're going to have that meal, you're going to be able to eat, and uh, just think about all the things that you're grateful for, which is a good thing to focus on in these times because um, you know, there's a lot going on around us. So if we focus on some positive things, uh, it tends to distract us, which is a good thing, from uh, all the other excitement that is being, that is bombarding our souls. We have a lot to talk about tonight or today, and uh, I want to just add one thing to our story, though, and that is um, I want to uh, just tell you an interesting uh, story real quick, see if this uh, opens this link. So. Um, I went to, uh, I was cruising uh, last summer in uh, British Columbia with my wife and we were tied up at a dock and the man next to me had some troubles with his uh, uh, fuel, uh, rather his water uh, pump, so his, the filter for his water system. So I took my tools, went into his boat and started helping him and he of course began telling me about his family. He had a son that lived uh, in Australia and was telling me, uh, or actually it was New Zealand, uh, that his son was a neurologist of all things and was studying things like fasting and something called a ketogenic, I don't you know, ketogenic diet, but he, I don't know if he even uh, knew much about it and said, but you probably won't know anything about that. And he, he was right because I'm a boat mechanic, right? I'm fixing his uh, water filter system. But anyway, as uh, to make a long story short, I ended up connecting with his son who's written some several very interesting papers. I've interviewed him on The Empowering Neurologist, and he's recently published a new study, I'm gonna post it to you right now, talking about the use of fasting, like we all did, many of us did uh, today, uh, as a therapeutic uh, for various types of neurological problems. So, something to think about. Let's get into our um, program for the day. I do want to tell you all that I have identified a very, very uh, meaningful website. I just posted it. Uh, it really gives a lot of very easy to understand information in terms of where we're having our problems, uh, what is the rate of uh, this uh, uh, COVID-19, how rapidly is it increasing, uh, et cetera. So a very uh, intriguing website. I was very uh, grateful to get that. And I guess I can't post an image to you from there. But uh, let's just jump right in and uh, give me one second, then we will take uh, questions, that's for sure. All right, so um, I want to start by uh, this very important discussion. I think it's extremely valuable. We know that we can spread the virus or it can be spread to us by coughing and sneezing. We know that surfaces can be contaminated and that can spread the virus to us. The real uh, concern is uh, air, breathing, uh, being downwind of somebody who happens to exhale and they may not know that they're infected. Turns out that the literature that's now coming out tells us that this may in fact be a big deal. Uh, I'm going to post to you uh, the citation for this, what I'm going to be discussing right now. And this is a bit of research that is, uh, why, while it's troubling, it's good to know. And the, the title of the study is The Coronavirus Pandemic and Aerosols. Does COVID-19 transmit via expiratory particles? So we're not talking about sneezing on somebody, coughing on somebody. We're talking about having a conversation with somebody who is infected. And as we've talked about uh, extensively, at least for two weeks now, that individual may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. In other words, they may have no symptoms or they may be getting ready to develop symptoms. So. They wanted to uh, determine, does this COVID-19 transmit via expiratory particles? Can we simply exhale and is that uh, infectious? And it looks like 
their conclusion is yes. Uh, we know that sneezes and coughs transmit what are called virus-laden respiratory uh, fluids, uh, but they want to discuss, uh, can a susceptible person inhale microscopic aerosol particles uh, from uh, just from somebody's breath? And most recently, epidemiologists calculated, get this, that about 86% of infections in Wuhan, China, prior to the implementation of travel restrictions, were from undocumented undocumented individuals, meaning those individuals with mild, limited, or no symptoms who were never tested. Notably, their modeling indicated that 79% of the actual documented cases were infected by other undocumented individuals. So we're talking about people who are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic and their ability to shed this virus when they talk to you or when they are simply breathing. Um, I'll continue. It appears that large numbers of patients who became ill enough to require hospital treatment could have themselves been infected by others who did not appear to be sick. So our interactions with people around town, uh, at the, the uh, takeout, at the restaurant, etc., uh, the interactions we have with people may very well be uh, very important in terms of a vector the editorial is, given the large numbers of expiratory particles known to be admitted during breathing and speech, and given the clearly high transmissibility of COVID-19, a plausible and important hypothesis is that a face-to-face -face conversation, I'm quoting, with an asymptomatic but infected individual, even if both individuals take care not to touch, might be adequate to transmit COVID-19, meaning you don't have to shake somebody's hand. What these authors are telling us is that having a conversation near a person or um, just being in the air that they are breathing may be sufficient to transmit the virus. And again, they may not know that they're infected. So it means the social distancing is very important, especially as I talked about a couple weeks ago, if you are downwind from somebody, maybe they're uh, six feet and upwind uh, from you, the wind blowing towards you, Maybe six feet in that circumstance is not enough. Also consider closed environments like elevators where people may have been recently. These airborne particles can remain floating around and, and may well be infectious. Um, I want to move on and we'll take questions about this because I know it is really, um, it's a real touch point. And uh, I, I will say that it's a powerful argument in my opinion for wearing a mask all the time when you're around other people. At home, everybody's not, everybody is that you know of it, that has been with you for two to three weeks likely doesn't, uh, they don't have the problem. Uh, but you know, if you're out, if you're in a store, if you're uh, going through a drive through by all means wear a mask, very, very important. And I will say of course that uh, people have said, uh, you know, don't get a mask if it's gonna take one from a healthcare provider, I'm all in for that. Now, let's move on. Uh, to something that's very exciting, and that is this immunoglobulins or antibodies uh, that can be harvested from somebody who has recovered and used as a treatment. I'm going to post that now, uh, right under Mitch Ra. Uh, Mitch Ra, wow, I look like I lost some weight. Yeah, with one day of um, uh, one day of uh, fasting. But anyway. So again, immunoglobulins, when you read about immunoglobulins, they are basically the same thing as uh, antibodies against something. They're created by a type of white blood cell that we have called plasma cells. And they bind to a particular uh, protein on a particular thing. And they then allow that uh, thing to be inactivated like a virus, uh, bacteria viruses, and it aids ultimately in the destruction of these viruses and the destruction of bacteria. Um, I'm going to be tomorrow on national television talking about this. Uh, it airs where I am, uh, Eastern Standard Time, at, at uh, 9 a.m. on Christian Broadcast Network, but don't know what time that uh, 700 Club airs in your area, uh, but you could check the listings for that. Anyhow, um, understand then that uh, there's a lot of research going on right now looking at harvesting the plasma from people who have recovered making sure it does not carry virus, but only other things like antibodies, making sure it's safe, 
making sure it's purified, then using that as a treatment. Guess what? Along with antivirals, that might be the home run. Um, so what this study that I just posted to you and is on drperlmutter.com talks about is that it's really important, I'll read this, uh, it's really important, it would be better if the immune antibodies were collected from patients who have recovered from COVID-19 in the same city or surrounding area in order to increase the chance of neutralizing the virus. Now, this is gonna take a little bit of working through, so stay with me on this. There are subtle variations in the virus that we know have already taken place. There's already an S form and an L form. Uh, the, um, the original one from uh, Wuhan and now a, a modified one that's making up about uh, the L form, making up about 70% of the cases that we see. Now you might think, gee whiz, if this uh, virus has already mutated to some degree, what happens to all of the um, immunization programs, all the vaccine protocols that are going on? Well, it turns out, I asked the same question, so I had to explore it for you. It turns out that the vaccines, most of them, many of them, are being developed not against the part of the virus that has mutated, but rather against a part that has not mutated called the spike protein. You know, when you see these pictures of the virus, what it looks like, it's got all these spikes sticking out of it, right? And that is one area for which um, these vaccines are being created. So it means that even the original research on the S-type uh, might well be uh, valuable in terms of creating a, uh, a vaccine. I want to read a quote from Franklin Roosevelt. And he says, it is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it, frankly, and try another. But above all, try something. Franklin Roosevelt. Now, uh, I want to read to you a, a question and then I'll get on to your questions. This one was actually sent to uh, our online uh, portal. The next time you do an update, could you address where we go next with COVID-19? Specifically, we are working now to flatten the curve, uh, so healthcare providers will not be overwhelmed. We may succeed, we may fail. We will have some number of people who uh, have not been exposed and some that survive about, whether it mild or serious, with the virus. But some will be immune, at least hopefully based on a recent study of monkeys, the macaque study that I shared several days ago, and some will not. Those who are not yet immune, will they have to shelter until there is a vaccine? It sounds like the severe cases are dangerous enough that we probably don't want to catch it deliberately, even if healthcare resources are available. I guess I'm wondering if I will be staying at home until sometime in 2021. I realize you don't have a crystal ball. Thank you for uh, your answer. So let me uh, respond, because this uh, question really gets to the heart of some important issues that we need to address. Um, first, uh, it does look as if getting this virus once uh, will uh, allow a person to become immune. As mentioned, that study, the only study that is available just yet, has only been done in macaque monkeys, but I think we can expect from previous experiences that this will likely happen, but it does not mean that we will therefore develop immunity for next year's coronavirus if indeed there is one. Having said that, uh, it, um, moving on to the rest of his question, if there isn't a vaccine available in the next year, does that mean we're going to have to continue our sheltering in place? Well, I think it really has to do with what you consider to be your risk. I'm in a high risk category by virtue of my age. So that said, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, I've thought about it. I've thought about, you know, because I know a lot of people who've had it, they've gotten to the other side. One guy driving down the street the other day on his bike said it wasn't that bad. Yeah, he's a lot younger than I am. But that said, um, I've thought about it, giving it a shot, going out and getting it, but um, it is a bad, a bad illness. And, uh, you know, we look at uh, Boris Johnson now uh, going into intensive care, and uh, it is indiscriminate in terms of who gets affected. We even see younger people being hospitalized. So I personally, I can't take a chance. I'm going to stay in as long as, it need, uh, as long as I need to, not waiting for an immunization or vaccine, but probably waiting at least for a darn good treatment, a darn good antiviral, perhaps in combination 
with immunoglobulins like we just talked about. So that's true. I don't have a crystal ball, but it's, uh, that's my answer and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Um, I don't, uh, I'm feeling a little bit light up headed, uh, light, light headed from uh, not eating, but usually after uh, move further on into a fast, uh, that tends to go away. Make sure to drink a lot of water and always think about your electrolytes. Okay. Let's move on. Um, the ventilators, how to think about them preparing. Uh, you know, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the problem with the shortage of ventilators, a, a large number of people going into an intensive care unit will need to go on a ventilator and there aren't enough currently to go around. Encouraging news from Washington state is that Governor Inslee was able to donate back, I think 400 ventilators to uh, the federal stockpile to make them available to other states. And how did they do that? Uh, they locked down and they, they just kept, the, they flattened the curve. So don't know where we're gonna go on that. And I don't know, uh, you know, if you ask how long are we going to be in this situation, it's not going to be two weeks. Uh, we were told that we're going to, we should expect the worst two weeks, uh, these two, next two weeks to come. My sense is that uh, two weeks from now, it's going to be a lot worse and we're still going to be in the thick of it. And um, the, you know, some of the estimates that I think are pretty valuable have indicated that the peak may be sometime in mid-June. Uh, that said, um, you know, we don't know. Uh, and uh, we need to, um, we need to prepare for the fact that this may go on for a long time. Okay, um, walk outside, no mask or gloves, get some fresh air and vitamin D. And Angel Bayless uh, Danke, uh, I would say that's great advice. If you wanna walk outside and there's nobody around you, absolutely, I can't imagine you'd need a mask. I think getting some sunshine, I don't think you need gloves. Go for your walk, come back to your house and everything should be fine. I totally agree with you. Uh, Aaron Kinney, I'm not taking a vaccine. Uh, I, and I don't know that I will either, uh, but if that's the only thing that might allow me to get, then get out, I, I am considering it. I've never had a flu shot, um, but I'm, you know, we're certainly thinking about how uh, aggressive this is. But that said, if there is an antiviral treatment that still will allow you to get coronavirus and then develop your own antibodies, that's a home run and I'm in for that. Um, do we need to worry about the virus infecting fresh produce? Uh, that's a very good question from, uh, uh, I already left, I can't read it. So that's a, that's a great question. What did we do yesterday, day before yesterday? So we received fresh produce. We received cucumbers, which got washed in the sink with soap and a brush. Tomatoes, same. Apples, same. Uh, spinach uh, got rinsed in soapy water and then dried and then cooked last night in a wok and the bag in which they were, that they were contained in was thrown away. Um, we did get uh, cauliflower, which I scrubbed with a soapy water and then left out for a day that will be cooked and not eaten raw. So um, yeah, we're eating, uh, we are eating fresh uh, produce. Um, I'm not sure that I wanna, um, that I wanna spray produce with bleach. Uh, I think soap may be enough. Uh, and so I guess you have to decide that one on your own. Um, there's a post here from Chris Wheatcraft about um, heart damage from a coronavirus, which is very interesting. Thank you for posting that. Uh, that's Wheatcraft. Uh, heart damage, yes, we're seeing heart damage in some individuals who have a bad coronavirus experience. And, um, and that said, it makes us then want to think twice about hydroxychloroquine. Why? Because hydroxychloroquine can also damage the heart. You got a person in the intensive care unit, uh, very sick, you're tempted to give them hydroxychloroquine, and they may be getting heart issues anyway by virtue of the virus itself. So we need to think about that. And uh, you know, this may not necessarily be like the flu, you get over it, and the next thing you know, you're back on your bike and having a great time. There may be some residual damage. We don't know if there's gonna be permanent damage, but there is some suggestion of some lung changes that may resemble pulmonary fibrosis and heart issues as well. Even a suggestion now of neurological complications when people are ill with coronavirus. Um, I rec recommend when going out, I thought they were only effective from 
being the, to, no. So let's talk about why, again, I'm in favor of the mask. It can protect the wearer. It can protect uh, people with whom you're nearby if you are infected and it'll keep you hopefully from touching your face. Is it 100%? No. Uh, if, uh, is anything less than an N95 mask less effective? Yes, it is. Uh, some masks are really fairly ineffective, uh, but at least it's a start. You know, if it's 10% effective, that's a certainly reasonable. Best thing to do is stay away from people. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, move through a couple more questions and, that, uh, and then be back with you guys tomorrow. Um, and uh, again, join me tomorrow on the 700 Club. Um, I will be on around uh, 9, 10 uh, Eastern Standard. I don't know what time that will air, but I'll be sharing some of this information and some up-to-date information. And um, I know that um, uh, I have liver issues. I don't. I'm reading uh, somebody's question. I have liver issues. Should I stay in? I would. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, go for a walk if you want. Don't know what medications you're on. Hello, uh, cousin Peggy. Uh, thank you for all the great information you've sent to me. Uh, ventilator returned to Oregon by Oregon, Washington. I uh, couldn't read it. Uh, it scrolled past too quickly. But again, thank you, Peggy. You've been sending me some great things from your uh, pal in Italy. Very, very helpful. What about vinegar? I don't think vinegar has been shown to be effective. Um, are you? What are thoughts on carnivore diet? Okay, I will. Uh, Anthony uh, Selivanov, what are my thoughts on the carnivore diet? I'm going to leave it with that and I'll answer the question. So the carnivore diet eating uh, meat and, uh, and virtually all animal products has become um, something of a discussion point lately. Uh, I don't think for, uh, I, I don't think it's the best idea. I think in the short term, perhaps if you're having some allergic issues with certain vegetables or uh, sensitivities it might be reasonable for a couple of weeks but I think long term you don't want to go on a diet that deprives you of dietary fiber there is no fiber in animal products at all and we desperately need fiber especially now why to nurture our gut bacteria our very important first line of defense as it relates to immunity our gut bacteria balance our immune systems uh, they calm inflammation, and there is a suggestion made by me, uh, although I haven't seen much in the literature yet, that the status of our microbiomes may have uh, a role to play in how we are responding to COVID-19. So I would tell, uh, I would explain that my uh, my view on a carn uh, purely carnivorous diet, purely meat-based diet, right now, uh, I would not be in favor of it, and that's my position. Okay, everybody, uh, I am going to sign off for now. I'll be back tomorrow. Um, I thank you all for your attention and uh, tune in on uh, 700 Club if you uh, care to watch that tomorrow and we'll talk later. Bye-bye.